Her Story is a program that explores women, leadership, and healthcare. Hello, and welcome to Her Story, an opportunity for us to talk with some just incredibly amazing women and understand their journeys to leadership. I'm Dr. Julie Gerberding, and I'm the Chief Patient Officer at Merck, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Sandy Fenwick, who's the CEO of Boston Children's Hospital, and a woman who's had an amazing leadership journey all of her own. So hello, Sandy, and, and welcome. Oh, well, thank you, Julie, and, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I uh, always have said and, and have said it actually through my whole journey that I've had the best jobs in the entire world. And today I really think this is, this is the top of the top. You know, we've been named the number one children's hospital by U.S. News and World Report for seven years in a row. And it has been an incredible journey. I've been here for 21 years and uh, it is truly a gift to the world. You know, you and I met in an inauspicious situation. I believe we were trying to crew a sailboat in Rhode Island <laughs> with probably very little sailing experience. But it was in that moment that I just got a chance to get to know you as a person um, and beyond your role as the CEO of the number one children's hospital in America. But you started back in Simmons College, and then you went to Texas to get your master's degree in health policy. How do you go from Boston to Texas? And how did you go from your undergraduate focus to pursuing that particular pathway? Well, Julie, I had an, another detour that was even more interesting. So I went to Simmons, uh, a wonderful college, now university. Um, and I was studying both uh, uh, biology, double major, chemistry, and pre-med. So I thought I was on my way to medical school. Uh, but I took a job as in research um, at the Harvard School of Public Health as my first job out of college. And one of the interesting things was that they said you could travel um, because we were doing a lot of public health work around the world. And so a couple months after I got there, they asked me if I would go to Saudi Arabia. And so in 1972, um, I went to Saudi Arabia to work on a project that they were working on, on an eye disease called trachoma. Um, we were set up in a, uh, in a lab in a hospital in uh, Dahran on the eastern shore. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, when I was there, the department chair came and said to me, we've been talking about you back at the house, back in Boston, and we see some real leadership here. Would you be willing to stay for the next two years and run the program? And so that was my first foray into uh, leadership, into science. So I stayed there for two years. I actually met my husband there. Um, so um, it was really a, an extraordinary time. I got to travel, got to work there, uh, was doing science, and then uh, we actually together, after we got married, uh, moved to Texas. So that's how I got to Texas. I did my master's there, continued to do research there. But I realized that leadership and getting my master's in, in healthcare administration was really the path that I, I wanted to pursue. So that's what then took me back to Boston. My husband went back to graduate school and, um, and I came to Beth Israel. And then the journey there was extremely wonderful in every respect as well. So when you think back to that time in Saudi Arabia, when someone recognized your leadership, what do you think they saw? What, what if you had to guess, what would you say made you stand out from, from the crowd, so to speak, that, that they placed a bet on you? Gosh, that was a long time ago, Julie. I'm uh, trying to look back and think about, I am very organized, um, extremely organized. Um, part of what we had to do there was to manage a, um, a team that went into the villages, um, organizing our trips back and forth out, uh, bringing the materials back that we collected. Um, the second year we did a, um, a clinical trial. And so organizing everything around how we were going to manage uh, giving the drugs to the patients. Believe it or not, it was doxycycline um, that we gave as a, as a first treatment for trachoma. Um, and, uh, and, and I think working with all of the um, interesting and varied uh, diverse people. So we had 
nurses, we had a couple of doctors, we had a secretary, uh, a driver. Um, we had to go into the um, government to get permission. And uh, I kind of was thrown into the deep end a little bit and just had to try and figure out how to do a little bit of every one of these things and keep the project going and reporting back into Boston. So I, I like that jumping into the deep end is when you uh, trace your trajectory from the Beth Israel to Boston Children's, you just have a set of progressive steps in your ladder. It's just kind of almost a linear ascension to, to the role that you have today. And along the way, um, there must have been other times when you were thrown in the deep end. What was probably one of the biggest challenges in, in, in your career progression that you kind of look back on and say, wow, I can't believe I did that? So there were several. Um, at the BI, I was always looking for new opportunities. Um, you know, what was coming sort of around the corner. And uh, as we were moving into uh, HMOs and into our first round of capitation and, you know, working to build a network, those were all sort of new and challenging opportunities. And no one else was really sort of interested in doing them. And so I sort of said, well, if there isn't anybody else. This is the right thing for the organization. Uh, it's a new opportunity to learn and to uh, take on new things. Um, I was in charge of the of the merger with the BI Deaconess and uh, the two two networks and systems, and that in, in and of itself was a uh, was an interesting challenge, uh, trying to bring the two very different organizations uh, together, and then you know as I, I moved up to corporate to really be a um, sort of a, a part of the leadership team that ran the system. But I think the biggest challenge was when I decided I really wanted to get back into uh, hospitals, uh, having been up at corporate for a couple of years, uh, and I went over to Children's. Um, that's when I, I arrived here. What I didn't understand, Julie, was the challenges that I would face here. Five months after I got here, the board uh, decided to make some changes in the top leadership and let go of the CEO and the president and COO and asked me if I would take on the role as the COO um, and permanently and then kind of step in for the CEO until they found a new CEO a year later. So uh, taking on a new organization, a new team, a new board, a new faculty, uh, and a, a huge operating deficit. Uh, we, were, we were in really desperate shape um, financially. We were eating into our endowment. Uh, there was no strategy. There was um, a lot of strife between the leadership and the board. Uh, there was no communication. Um, morale was in the, in the depths. So I was, I, I was not only thrown into the deep end, I don't think there was any water there. <laughs> Uh, uh, and so, you know, it was little by little tackling, you know, just one big challenge after another. And, uh, you know, people still reference those years. That was 1999 to 2001, two, and we did it. We turned this place around and obviously are who we are today. Uh, I, I had the privilege of visiting the hospital uh, in the recent past and not only seeing just the incredibly beautiful facility and the care that you feel the minute you walk in the door, but also the incredible research enterprise that you've built kind of surrounding uh, the Children's Hospital and, and what that really means for the quality of care that you can provide. But, you know, this courage, the, the courage of jumping into the deep end, where, where did that resilience and that confidence come from? Oh, you know, I think it's my parents. I think it's my background. You know, my, my, my grandparents were immigrants. My parents, uh, you know, they, they came with nothing. Um, my parents did not go to college. And, you know, they obviously believed deeply in um, not only education, but community and people and hard work, um, but also self-confidence. And my dad and mom said, you can do anything you ever want to do. You can be anything you want to do. You can believe, and, but most importantly, believe in yourself. And those were the words that have stuck with me ever since. And as I think about, you know, the sort of the things that drive me, it's um, passion, um, passion for the work that, that you do, the purpose of the work that you do, and the courage to take on 
uh, you know, every step along the way, uh, sort of the next hill. And we have lots of hills, Julie, you and I, um, many times during our career in, in many of your wonderful uh, parts of your journey. Uh, there's always going to be a challenge. There's always going to be a crisis. And one just has to figure out how you're going to uh, both break it up into bite-sized pieces and, and tackle it. Um, but also always in your in the back of your head is, you know, do what do what is the right thing to do with integrity and honesty and, and trustworthiness. And so those are sort of characteristics that have always guided me. So it's being true to your values, knowing your purpose, and um, just basing your success on the confidence that you acquire as you go forward. Thanks to your parents. Right? Thanks to my parents. <laughs> So, you know, one of the things I've, I've noticed about your bio is that you have a lot of board service, both um, publicly traded company boards, but also nonprofit and, and community kind of boards. What do you think that serving on a board brings to you and what do you try to bring to a board? And I'm asking the question because a lot of people are striving or kind of interested in board opportunities. They're not really sure where to get started or why and when. Sure, so um, this was something that I actually was interested in actually 30 years ago was the first board I joined. And it was an opportunity. It was the Greater Boston YMCA. Um, and part of it was um, beginning to understand how other organizations really worked. I was very interested in board and governance and how organizations are, are led and governed. I was very interested in how other, both at that point, other nonprofits uh, were successful. And it was an opportunity to really begin to um, be connected to the, the business community because many of the people on the board were business leaders. And uh, so that was one uh, one reason. I believed in the mission uh, of the organization because it was really, interestingly enough, even though it was the YMCA, they were doing an enormous amount for children and, and women um, with opportunities and housing and, uh, and job training and the like, not just for men, but clearly for women and families. Um, so I believed in the purpose. Um, I then joined my, my, both my children's boards of their schools. Um, that was about, you know, ensuring that the organization was healthy and, and, and again, made enormous relationships with both community members as well as business leaders. And they have all been relationships that I have kept uh, as friends and as business colleagues ever since. Um, I joined a, uh, I was asked to join a public company board about 15 years ago uh, from a wonderful colleague that I had met who was the CEO and, and looking to expand the board and become more diversified because she was a woman and she was looking for another woman to join her board. Um, and so luckily I, I, I was able to do that. I was on that board for 10 years. Again, uh, I believed in the product that they were working on. Uh, I, I learned so much from uh, the, the other people because this was a world I wanted to learn more about for my own institution. So it was a biotech company. It was a specialty biopharma company. Uh, it had gone public. And so it was a whole new world about being in the commercial and uh, corporate world. And uh, I just kept learning and trying to bring back to my own institution more um, rigor around governance, more understanding about uh, how one really could uh, drive some of our own research into the commercial world and get it faster and closer to patients. What was what were the hurdles? How did we understand the details around the FDA and approvals and everything else? So it has always been a, what can I learn and bring back? And then uh, over time, as I learned, what could I contribute from my experiences? Uh, you know, obviously people were very interested in what is, how does a hospital work? How do hospitals make decisions? Um, what are the things that you struggle with? How, what are the HR issues? What are the compliance issues? What are the technology issues? So there are a lot of um, opportunities for back and forth uh, contribution. And so that's the way I have looked at now my most recent corporate board. I think your story is really compelling because a lot of times when I'm 
mentoring or counseling young women, um, you know, they're striving to be on a Fortune 500 publicly traded company board, but that starts often at a community level. And as you said, getting on the board of your children's schools or serving on a library board or a church board, whatever it is, um, gives people that initial credibility and credential because once you're on a board, your network by definition expands and then you have the chance to meet other people, which leads to more board opportunities and, you know, it, it feeds forward. So I, I, I think your story is exactly exemplary of how we can support each other, but also start with what's within reach and gradually build your resume and your credentials to be able to participate in that kind of service. And the higher you go in the organization, the more rare it is for women to be in the majority role. So clearly there have probably been opportunities in your work um, trajectory, your, your, your leadership trajectory, where you've had to be the N of one in the room or really recognize that, that we haven't really achieved the kind of diversity and inclusion that we're striving for. Tell us about some of that and, and how you've been able to reshape your own organization to be a more diverse and inclusive culture. Because I heard that when I was there um, and I, I'm interested in, in how, you, how you went about that. Oh, I, I think this is probably one of the most important things we need to think about. And it's diverse from every perspective. And so when I think about diversity, I think about it broadly, about equity and inclusion. So for me, it's, a, it's comprehensive. And it goes for to everything from gender to uh, race, uh, ethnicity, language, culture, uh, thought, um, differences of opinion. Uh, differences of backgrounds and expertise. And so all of those things, whether it is starting at the board level um, of any organization, um, how are we really thinking carefully about uh, all of the contributions that the people, especially for small boards, uh, because there you have, you know, limited opportunity to say, you know, how many of these things can we, um, can we find in an, in an individual characteristics, both human and, and, uh, and experience and, and expertise. Uh, so for me, it, it starts at every at the top of an organization, and you can't you can't talk about it in you know in, in a whole organization if you're not demonstrating it at every level. Then it's true of the management. Um, it has to be absolutely a, a diverse and a a, a, a carefully uh, constructed uh, management team. And uh, I, you know we have really a wonderful management team here. My, my leaders um, at Beth Israel believed in that strongly as well. So I come from watching and observing um, others who believed in it strongly and not only saw the value of it, but also how to make it intentional and how to make sure that it's at the board level, it's at the management level, it filters down as you're thinking about leaders across the organization and then it's it's everywhere it's really thinking about how do you make sure that everyone feels that you have an environment that is welcoming respectful open to uh, conversation uh, people can speak up and uh, whether it is you know we had a lot of trainings around the me too movement we're now doing and we just committed uh, to doing 100 percent a training of our, our close to 20,000 people here of unconscious bias training. And we're gonna do that across the organization and all the way up to the board. So you have to be intentional about it. It has to be at the top of your agenda. You have to have the willingness and the boards I sit on, um, I talk about it, um, have to have those difficult conversations when it's not there and then make it something that you, um, not only for the people that are in your organizations, but obviously as you think about everyone you wanna serve, because if they don't see the faces, uh, the languages, the understanding of their own differences in the people that they're being served by, you're really not uh, completing the, the full meaning of equity and, and inclusion. Is there a circumstance that you've encountered throughout your career where you had to deal with this on a personal basis where you felt that you were not treated in the appropriate way, either because of your gender or 
your education or whatever. Um, you know, these things come up from time to time, even under the best work environments with the most well-intentioned people. Oh, Julie, I think we've all had incidents um, where we have been either belittled, um, we've been tested. I remember hiding my pregnancy because I was afraid that it was, you know, really going to work against me. Um, although it, it clearly didn't when it when I, you know, when I finally had a <laughs> had to declare that I was pregnant. Um, but I think one time really does stand out, and it's a funny time because it was very hard. Um, my first promotion at Beth Israel was in a difficult circumstance when uh, my, again, my predecessor in a role was being asked to step away from the role. And I was asked to take over and I'd only been in the hospital for a year. And uh, this, this administrator's partner, physician partner, um, really was angry. And so I had to go have a meeting with him and he was brutal. Um, absolutely brutal. I had to defend myself. Why did I think I should get this role? Um, you know, I really had no experience in the hospital. I had very little experience, um, you know, uh, on and on and on. And I just kind of stood my ground and, and basically said, I thought I had this experience for this reason that I really was dedicated to learning everything I needed to. And, um, you know, we kind of left uh, not on the not on the happiest terms, but I basically started to work with him. Um, I tried to embrace and engage his uh, his own knowledge, and we've become really good friends wow. up until the today. And in fact, I heard from him last week. Um, he he stays in touch with me. He's still working at the BI, and uh, we've kind of uh, kind of found a wonderful journey. Um, but it was tough and I just basically had to put that aside and, and keep going forward and prove to him that I could do the job. Takes courage, right? Courage and yeah. candor, it's tough. So now the news is full of your retirement plans. Um, you know, you had a really long and incredibly successful run at Boston Children's. I'm sure many people are mourning the anticipation of that change. How did you decide that it was time to make a move like that and you know if you want to share with us what you're thinking about doing next of course we'd all love to be able to gossip about that um, but you know how, how do you know when it's time to make a big move like that it's never an easy decision and I tell you it's been agonizing thinking about when to do this I started having a conversation I truly believe in very mindful succession planning uh, at every level um, within my organization uh, at the board level. And so several years ago, I realized we also had to think about board succession. Um, we have had the most fabulous board and board chair for many years. And so I thought about, you know, how do we do this here at the hospital? And what's the right order and, and uh, the right timing of all of this? And we knew we couldn't do a lot of ch uh, change together. And so we basically started to talk about what would be the right uh, timing in the right order for a, a succession about a couple of years ago. And um, I sort of picked a date, which sounded like it was way out there <laughs> in the future. Um, and, and it was, you know, in the 2020, 2021 timeframe. And um, the other thing I, I also felt strongly about uh, was really trying to see if there was ever any way that I could do a smooth and very thoughtful handoff uh, to my successor. And so I uh, wanted to see if there was some way that I could bring on board when I first became the CEO, someone that could eventually take over. And that has all taken place. Um, it has been a wonderful partnership and journey that I've had with Dr. Kevin Churchwell, uh, who uh, I recruited to be my partner as the uh, COO and CMO at the time. Um, I then promoted him to president about a couple years ago, and he will, he was just named uh, uh, this, the upcoming CEO uh, a couple weeks ago. And so, you know, thinking about how to plan for this in a very mindful and strategic way was something that I've always thought about in terms of the way I do my work. And then I had to kind of do it for myself uh, and for the organization. 
And while it feels absolutely right um, from the organization's perspective, I think it uh, is going to be a wonderful, smooth transition. Uh, we have a great plan for the next decade and beyond. And I think, you know, there's always a time when you really want someone to, uh, to take over for that next big chunk of work, uh, the next changes that we know are coming. And so at some point it's right to turn over those, um, the, the execution of those goals and strategies to someone else. So that's the way I thought about it. Um, I now have four grandchildren, one that's just been born a couple weeks ago. Um, and my husband uh, that I met in Saudi Arabia that I've been married to for 46 years, uh, you know, I realized that uh, life is also short and um, I am very interested in continuing my work for children, uh, for women, uh, for healthcare, both science and technology where it's going. And I think that there's another way to not necessarily take on another big, you know, kind of CEO role but to participate in um, you know, many other community ways and, uh, and other organizational ways. So it feels right and uh, I'm hoping it is right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm thinking back to that young leader in Saudi Arabia who was offered the next big opportunity because she was organized. Um, and you have, I think, managed to sustain that theme throughout your career, right up through this decision about succession and retirement in a very organized, thoughtful manner. So kind of seeing the balance between your amazing strategic competencies and turning around a hospital system, growing an endowment, building a research enterprise, and at the same time, just the discipline in the organization that you've been able to use as kind of your modus operandi throughout that entire spectrum. It's just, it's a wonderful exemplar of leadership. So we've come to the end of our time and I, I hate to end this conversation, but I do wanna ask you one last question and, and that really relates to the fact that um, not everyone gets to write a book about their story, but if you were going to write a book about your story, would you have a theme or a, a title in mind of how you would claim your story? Absolutely. You know, I go back to what my dad always said to me, and that is love what you do and do what you love and, you know, do it with passion and purpose. And somewhere in there, there's a title, but, uh, you know, that is really what I would talk about. It's, um, you know, leading with passion and purpose and, uh, and, and loving every day, getting up and learning and being surrounded by the most extraordinary people. Um, people are everything to me, Julie, and uh, I have been so blessed to work with people and getting to know someone like you in my journey um, is really the blessing that, uh, that I've been, that I've had the opportunity to have. Well, I can't think of a more lovely way to end a conversation, Sandy. Thank you so much, Sandy Fenwick, for everything you've done for the children of the world, but also in sharing your story with our viewers. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.